Well, good morning. Um, it's Saturday morning, and I'm up here at school. I'm going to make this video um, on simplifying radical expressions. This is, for me anyway, this is kind of fun to teach. And the reason I say it's fun to teach, um, most of you, or I'd say well, maybe all of you, have not had to simplify radical expressions before. So the reason I say it's fun to teach, a lot of times in math, I'm, I'm teaching something to you that you've kind of already learned before, and I'm just kind of adding a couple new things. So I, I end up just rehashing things you know and trying to add on to that. This is one of those things where you probably have never been taught it before, so I'm teaching it to you from scratch, and when I see that you understand it, I feel good because it was something that I know I was able to help you understand. Okay, so simplifying radical expressions. Let's have your book open to page 719. And I think what I'm going to do, because this, a lot of this material is brand new, I'm going to break this up into two videos, so I don't want to have a, a marathon video. The first video, we're going to go through what it means to simplify radical expressions and the rules for that. And then the second video I'll put together over this will have examples from problems, some of your homework problems in the book that you can watch, and we'll actually walk through those homework problems, all right? So let's talk about... Um, why this would be important. First of all, I can tell you right now in geometry, a lot of times when we write our final response, we leave our answers in simplified radical form because those are exact. Um, there are certain radicals that when you put them in your calculator, the calculator must round it. And if, you're t if Mrs. Nettleman or, or uh, Mr. Keller wants an exact answer from you, they're going to ask you to write it in radical form. So y you will be using this next year. Um, a radical expression is in simplest form if all the following are true. Now, if I read these off just the way they are, um, you, it might not make total sense. So I'll slow this down after I read it make sure we understand what each of these things are saying. Um, so the first rule, a radical is in simplest form if the radicand is no perfect square factors other than one inside of it. Okay, so if you're like, what the heck did you just say? Well, remember, the radicand is just a, a term that means the this, this square root. This is the radical symbol. Okay, so here, the number under here has no perfect square factors other than one inside of it. So let's talk about the perfect square factors. I made you earlier in the year learn those. I'll write them off to the side here real quick. Um, here, here are the perfect square factors. Let's think. 1, okay, now I, will, I know 1 goes into 50, but it said no perfect square factors other than 1. Okay, let me see. 4, well, I know 4 is a perfect square, but it doesn't go into 50. 9 is a perfect square, doesn't go into 50. 16 is a perfect square. Nope. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. 25 is a perfect square, and 25 goes into 50. So the square root of 50, 50 does have a perfect square that would go into it other than 1. So for example, this is not simplified, which is why I crossed it out. I'll show you how to simplify here in a little bit. All right, so that's what the first rule is. The number underneath the radical symbol, if it has a perfect square number that would divide evenly into it, then it is not simplified. All right, let's go to the second rule of radicals. And oh, I got a erase this off. I don't want this here right now. Okay, the second rule. You cannot have fractions inside of the radicand. Okay, so when we have a, a square root of something, if there is a fraction inside of it, that is not simplified. So that's an easier rule to understand than the first one. And then the final rule, no radicals can appear in the denominator of the fraction. So that would be an example like this. If I had um, 16 over the square root of 5. Okay, I'm going to cross that out right now. <coughs> this is not written in simplest form because I do indeed have a radical in the denominator. Now, you notice it's, it's very specific here. It says the, I cannot have a radical in the denominator of a fraction. That means the bottom. It is totally legal or acceptable to have a radical in the numerator. You just cannot have it in the denominator. So those are the three rules regarding when you simplify a radical, okay, we cannot have a radical in the denominator. We cannot have a fraction inside the radical. 
And if we just have, if we have a number inside of the radical, that number can have no perfect square factors other than one. So in other words, if you can divide that number by a perfect square, let me add a few to the list here. If I can divide that number by any of these perfect square numbers, and as you know, that list keeps on going, keeps on going. If I can divide this number by any of these perfect square numbers, then, then the radical is not in simplest form, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Let's keep on moving here. Radicals also have certain properties, and these properties are very similar to properties that you have learned with just normal um, numbers, okay? Products, remember products is multiply. You can multiply radicals together. And you'd multiply radicals just like you would normal numbers. Like if I had the square root of 2 times the square root of x, that would equal the square root of 2x. Or if I had the square root of 3 times the square root of 5, that would equal the square root of 15. Um, one thing I probably should make clear in my video right now, now when you, when you multiply radicals, you can see you might be like, that's just like multiplying normal numbers. It just has a radical around it. Here's what you can't do. <coughs> you can't take the square root of 2, for example, times just plain 3 and call that, okay, it does not equal this. I'm going to put this in red because this is wrong. I've seen people do this. They'll call that the square root of 6. Well, that's not true. If, if we had square root of 2 times square root 3, I would get square root of 6. Actually, that does not work here. What this would work into, uh, what this would actually work into would actually be that you would get, let me get uh, black, I don't want red because this is correct. This, you can't actually multiply these together because I have a radical here and I don't here. I would just write that this is equal to 3 times the square root of 2. I can't combine those into one term because I don't have square roots around each, okay? Um, since you can multiply radicals, you can also factor them also, okay? Since you can multiply radicals, you can also factor them. So here would be examples of that. Factoring is basically dividing them. So if I have the square root of 9y, I could break that up into the square root of 9 times the square root of y. And if you think for a minute the square root of 9 is just 3, I could rewrite this into 3 times the square root of 9. Or the square root of 50. Here's a second example. Well, the square root of 50, remember, there is a perfect square number. Let me go back one slide. There is a square root, uh, perfect square, I should say, number that goes into 50. Perfect square number that goes into 50. 25 goes into 50. So I can break the square root of 50 into square root of 25, square root 2, and the square root of 25 is 5, so I get 5 square root 2. And finally, remember that when you take the square root of a um, variable to a even power, I can do, I can square root that. The square root of x squared, remember, would just be x. Square roots and squares are inverse operations, and they kind of cancel each other out. So I had another example here. It'd be like if I had, if I had, and let me highlight that, uh, if I had x to the fourth, and I take the square root of x to the fourth, remember, that would equal x squared times x squared. So the square root of x to the fourth is x squared. Okay? The square root of x to the sixth would be x cubed, because x cubed times x cubed is x to the sixth. I would have six factors of x. Here are some other properties of radicals. Quotients. Quotients means division. When working with radicals that are quotients, you can rewrite the expression into two radicals. And here's what I mean by that. If we have the square root of 2536, that you, it is legal to break this up into a fraction where I just took the radical and just individually, I took the radical uh, and took the radical under the numerator and the denominator. So I can break this up basically into two parts. And now if I take the square root of 25, I get 5, and the square root of 36 is 6. So when I have the square root of the entire fraction, I can kind of break that up into two little, I guess, minor problems here. I have the square root of 25 over the square root of 36, and that's 5, 6. Totally legal and acceptable to do that. 
Okay, but remember, one of the first rules I gave you on the first slide, let me go back to that slide real quick. Okay, I can never have a radical in the denominator of my fraction. So I'm putting that in red here. You can never leave a radical in the denominator. Like here, I did not. I took the square root of 36 and I changed it to 6, so that's fine. Okay, cannot leave radicals in the denominator. You can get rid of radicals in the denominator in the following way. Very simple to do. Okay, take for example, let's say we had the fraction 3 over the square root of 5. Right here. I start with that. To get rid of the square root of 5 in the denominator, now think for a minute, I don't know what the square root of 5 is. It's not, the 5, remember, is not a perfect square. And none of my perfect square numbers divide evenly into 5 other than 1, so I can't, can't break this up into anything. So the square root of 5, I, I can't get rid of that right now. What you can do to get rid of the square root of 5 is just multiply the numerator and the denominator by the square root of 5. Now think for a minute when you do that. The square root of 5 divided by the square root of 5, really, this is just 1. This is another way of writing 1, something divided by itself. Whenever you multiply something by 1, it doesn't change it. So since I'm multiplying really by 1 here, I'm not changing the overall value of the number. I'm just changing the way it looks. It'll still equal the same amount. But here's the thing. If you take the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 in the denominator, you get the square root of 25. And remember from what we talked about earlier, I can't really take 3 times the square root of 5 and get one term out of that, I guess. Uh, I'm just going to have to write it as 3 square root of 5. But here's the thing now. The square root of 25, I can do that. The square root of 25 is just 5. I end up with 3 square root of 5 over 5. Now there is no, um, there is no radical in my denominator. That's, it's okay to have a radical in the numerator. Not okay to have one in the denominator. Now the neat thing about this, if you took, if you did take your calculator right now, and you go back to where we started, and you type three divided by square root of five in your calculator and see what you get, and then you go over here to what we finished with. Let me take my yellow pen. You'd have to put parentheses around this before you put it in your calculator. But if you type in 3 square root 5 in parentheses divided by 5, you'll get the same thing. So again, we didn't change the value. We just changed the way it looked. We never want to have a radical in the denominator. Okay? And then one other, or I guess two other major operations. We talked about how you multiply radicals and how you divide them, how to factor them. We haven't talked about sums, adding, and differences, subtracting of radicals. When you add or subtract radicals, there are some special rules that we got to apply to that too. I always think of radicals when I'm adding or subtracting them. It's kind of like working with variables. You can only add or subtract like radicals. So here are some examples. Like let's say I had 2 square root 5 plus 4 square root 5. Do you notice how I have r like radicals? I have, I have the square root of 5 in each of these. Let me underline that. Okay, I have 2 square root of 5, and I have 4 square root of 5. I have a grand total of 6 square root of 5. It's kind of like pretending that these are x. 2x plus 4x would be 6x. Radicals, in a way, you can kind of treat them when you add like, like a variable, basically. All right, here would be another example. I have 10 square root 13 plus 3 square root 7 minus 4 square root 13. Well, let me get out my marker again. There are two radicals in the statement that are alike. I have square root 13s alike. Those are the only two that I can combine together. The square root of 7 is not alike. It's like, again, it's like variables. It's like having x and y's. I can't add and combine x and y's into one term. Okay, but I can combine these together. They have a like radical. Well, 10 radical 13 minus 4 radical 13 is 6 radical 13. I still have this extra plus 3 radical 7. This is the best I can do to simplify this. I, I took 1, 2, 3 terms and rewrote it into 2. I can't add these together. They are not like radicals. And so therefore, you know, and subtracting is going to be the same rules. So remember, radicals are simplified if all the following are true. They have no perfect square factors other than 1, which means, like when I look here, I can't simplify these anymore because there's no perfect square factor other than 1 that will divide into 13. 
and there's no perfect square factor other than one that will divide into seven, so that's covered. There's no fractions in underneath the radical. Well, I don't have any fractions here. And there's no radicals in the denominator. In this case, you don't see a denominator. So this statement here follows all three rules, same here. And I think this is where I'm going to cut off um, for my first video and stop, because from here we're going to actually try some problems together, and I will do that then on my next, on my next video. And my next video then we'll do some practice problems that we can walk through. All right? Um, I hope that made sense.